come here this evening to talk about an obvious yet neglected, an embarrassing yet enticing, a common yet bewildering, a touching yet mockery provoking subject. That is self love. Self love is not narcissism. Self love isn't the kind of excessive self centeredness exemplified so perfectly by countless bikini bays and shirtless hugs on Instagram. Self love, in my opinion, simply is a conscious knowing of ours. That is, regardless of our race, religion, physical attributes, and sexual orientation, the juvenile mistakes that we have made, the egotistic bravado that we have displayed, and the epic failures that we have had, we will always be accepting and supporting us for who we are unconditionally while embracing human experience in all of its complexities wholeheartedly. In the mind of many people, love is a cheesy subject which has been serenaded for centuries in countless pop songs. From the legendary King of Pop to the Pop Princess of Bracken Ball, from the iconic Material Girl to the five British boys who declare their one love to the world on a double-decker bus passing across the London Bridge. Love was, is, will always be one of the most talked about subjects in our world. In our world, people express their love actively in pop songs. Pop songs are in integral part of pop culture. Pop culture is a reflection of the greater social trend of its own time. Since majority of the pop songs through generations continue to celebrate and perpetuate the importance of seeking external instead of internal love to signify one's wholeness. Does this cross-generational phenomenon explain why, in many of our cases, the amount of love that we have for ourselves hasn't been on a steady rise for a long, long time, ever since we left our childhood behind? All of us were born because of love. We all loved ourselves unconditionally when we were toddlers, babies, and kindergartners. Have you heard any preschooler ever complain to you? Man, I'm so chubby. I don't have a perfect, perfect body. I don't look anything like those Victoria's Secret Angels, star athletes, or the sexiest men alive on the cover of People magazine. No. All of us were these little cute, unprocessed peanuts who could not have been more proud of who we were and what we looked like. So much so that we loved to show our assets off every chance we had by giggling innocently and running around naked in front of everybody. <laughs> As we continue to run, we left our childhood innocence behind. As we continue to run, we came to understand the established rules and social doctrines. As we continue to run, we brainwashed our mind with one type of beauty ideal and with a narrow conventional definition of normality. As we continue to run, all of us changed. Wrong information always shown by the media. Negative images are the criteria. Infecting the young minds faster than the bacteria. Kids want to act like what they see 
in a cinema. These words from the 2003 pop song, Where is the Love by the hip hop group Black Eyed Peas, tellingly expose the impact that our social environment has on our informative years. We changed because we were told to. We changed because we were taught to. All of us changed because we felt that we had to. We were familiarized with the prestige and importance of external recognition early on. Our desire to please people in our lives in exchange for rewards in the form of attention, sweets, and kisses in granting us the superiority of external adoration. For us to feel included, we didn't mind being silly in front of our family and friends. Starting out as an innocent game of play and reward eventually arrived, arrived at a point where our brain naturalized the act of pleasing others first as the shortcut to popularity and happiness. As life continued, as we went through different stages of the growing process, from primary school to high school, from high school to college and university, the ever-changing influences of our parents, teachers, other adults, society at large, and media help solidify collectively the role that external love played in our lives. A type of periodical solidification which eventually facilitated the transition from our desire to please people in our lives to our striving to conform to various ideals. In doing our best to conform, we realize the sky isn't the limit, but our personal abilities have limits too. In doing our best to conform, we came to understand that the differences between our friends and us. In doing our best to conform, we realize the unfortunate, deeply rooted reality saturated with countless stereotypes, norms, and hierarchies. The overlapping of our countless realizations makes us understand that despite the best of our effort, we are not all going to be the person who is usually associated with the complementary adjectives of the highest comparative degree. It is then that our love for ourselves begins to decrease. Now don't get me wrong, I'm here to neither encourage you all to become a rabble, nor completely disregard the notion of conformity. Our world would be an anarchy if none of us follow the rules. The message that I'm trying to convey here is that though we may not all be the subject of public adoration, though it is necessary to follow rules and to obey orders and to celebrate the mainstream fabulosity of, of all kinds in our cosmos, however, we must not lose sight of who we are and should never underestimate our lovability and what we individually can offer to the world. Why do we need self-love? First of all, all of us are going to live with us for the rest of our lives, so we might as well embrace both of our perfection and imperfection because we have no choice. Second of all, if we didn't love ourselves, how could we expect others to love us? 
if we didn't love ourselves, how could we expect by our parents to、uh, friends and relatives to support us? If we didn't love ourselves, we would forever be a spectator rather than a participant in life. Life is an adventure. Life is all about living. To live life to the fullest, we have to be daring and gutsy. To be daring and gutsy, we need confidence, of which self-love. Is an important component. <clears throat> In other words, for all of us to have a good life, we have to be self-loving first. Having enough love for ourselves is certainly the starting point to have a healthy mentality and a disciplinary willfulness. Quite often, the amount of love that We have for ourselves isn't something recommended to be spoken about constantly, because in verbalizing how much we love ourselves, we may come across as shameless, self-centered braggarts. Interestingly enough, though, the amount of love that we have for ourselves can be noticeably observed. It shows in how we dress. It shows in the choice of our language. It, sh- it shows in the type of food that we put into our body. It shows in the way in which we carry ourselves in public, in the amount of respect that we have for our family, our friends, and acquaintances. Also, in the level of courtesy. That we show to complete strangers. Self-love is a gift that all of us were born with, that some of us lost along the way, that all of us can regain at any point on our life's journey. If you would like to retrieve this long-lost gift, I have four tips to share with you. The first tip: bombard yourself with positive quotes and affirmations. In recent years, there is a really popular affirmation: "Be calm and love yourself." Though it is simple, however, it is a timeless reminder of how much respect and love are needed for. All of us to have a good life. Words of pos- and positive quotes and affirmations can provide all of us with a profound and deep resonance. The words of our parents, friends, may not always be able to achieve. Second tip: put those quotes and affirmations to the practice. The late author Ash. The first African American to win men's single and at Wimbledon and U.S. Open, and the first African American to be ranked number one in the world, once said, "Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can." Thinking positively alone is not enough to boost the amount of love you have for yourself. In its action, remembering to be calm and love yourself is one thing. Practicing be calm and love yourself is a tougher ball game to play. Take a small step each and every day, consistently. In time, all of us will notice the results that we have been looking for for so long. Third tip: Take a deep and honest look into your own eyes when you're ready for a profound, loving self-transformation. 
It is surprising to learn just how many people are so uncomfortable looking themselves in the eyes. Because in looking through the windows to your soul, you may see, more importantly, feel the hidden vulnerabilities that only you know. All the self-deprecating thoughts and mind monologues you've been engaging with yourself. This is me as a topic. I sometimes wonder why I keep feeding him on a daily basis with endless words of self-deprecation while giving so generously to others words of encouragement. Take a deep and honest look into your eyes. The few drops of tears that you shed might just be the emotional cleansing that you need. Fourth and last tip. Take an inventory of your friends. I'm sure most of you, most of us, have heard this saying before. If you would like to find out what kind of person you are, just take a look at the five people with whom you hang out regularly. <laughs> On our path to self-transformation, friendly support is needed. Stay away from the naysayers. Get rid of the disingenuous friends who don't believe in you. If we allow those self-sabotaging thoughts and habits to affect us, our newly cleansed inner space could be once again filled up with emotional jumps, and your road to self-transformation could be majorly derailed. When I first entered university, I was overwhelmed by the sheer number of people that I came across on campus. I remember once I asked a friend of mine, how do you make friends on campus? To which she replied, I smoke. <laughs> I lay my lighter to a stranger. We smoked together. We had a small chat. Then we became friends. As somebody who's never been a fan of cigarettes, her friendship born out of some common bond over some dry herbs has never appealed to me. Once I watched an interview given by a monk on TV in which he said, our body is our temple, which love ourselves unconditionally by taking good care of our body with no compromise. Knowing that, I don't know why there's so many common folks who are so willingly jeopardizing their one and only temple by destroying it with alcohol and drugs for the excuse of youthful experiment or you only live once. <laughs> YOLO. <laughs> but the negative consequences can last for years to come. At the end of the day, having self-love is all about being responsible for yourself. It's a sign of maturity in knowing what to do and what not to do. So those who love us dearly do not have to put up with or endure the hardship caused by our thoughtless action. When John Lennon was young, his teacher asked him once, what do you want to be when you grow up, John? Lennon said to her, I would like to be happy. She thought John didn't understand the question. John said to her, you don't understand life. To be happy in life, we have to recognize our individuality and uniqueness and bring them to use for the betterment of not only ours, but also of the world. To make that a reality, we need to be self-loving first, because self-love comes before self-recognition and the subsequent self-happiness. Tonight, I have explored a topic that is considered to be obvious and yet neglected. Embarrassing, yet enticing. Common, yet bewildering. Touching, yet mockery-provoking. Regardless of which one of these words that tingles your heartstring, I sincerely hope that all of you have been made aware of the necessity to cherish and nurture the greatest 
love that you ever had in this lifetime. That is your love for yourself. Thank you.